Welcome to the Revolution Church Podcast. Before we begin, we'd like to remind you that our ministry is supported 100% by listeners like you. To make your 100% tax-deductible donation today, please visit revolutionchurch.com slash donate. You can also learn more by clicking the donate section on the website. So, I'm going to start in Ecclesiastes today. It's a real uh, upper... But you'll see why. Uh, 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 uh. Um, Ecclesiastes 1, uh, 1 through 18. The words of the teacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. Vanity of vanity, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What do people gain from all the toil? at which they toil under the sun. A generation goes, and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises, and the sun goes down, and hurries to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south, and goes around to the north. Around it goes, the wind, and its circuit, and the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full to the place where the streams flow. There they continue to flow. All things are wearisome. More than one can express. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, or the ear filled with the hearing. What has been is what will be. And what has done, what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there nothing in which is... Is there a thing of which it is said, See this, a new, it has already been. And the age before us, the people of the long ago, are not remembered. Nor will there be any remembrance of people yet to come, by those who come after them. So, so far, pretty, uh, pretty uplifting stuff. Not really. Uh, pretty uh, depressing stuff. Continue. Let's continue to go down this fun, uplifting verse, uh, chapter. I, the teacher, when the king over Israel and Jerusalem appealed to my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven, it is unhappy business that God has given me, given to human beings to be busy with. I saw all the deeds and all they're done under the sun. And I see all is vanity and is changing after it is chasing after the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight. And what is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all those who were over Jerusalem before me. And my mind has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I apply my mind to knowing wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that I, I perceived that this also, but chasing after the wind. This is also what is but chasing after the wind, for much of wisdom is much vexation, and those who are increased knowledge increase sorrow. So what is this like a lamentation? Is that what they call it? It's uh you hear a bit of sorrow in these writings, a bit of hopelessness, a bit of everything is worthless, nothing new under the sun. Dust in the wind. Of course, he never saw an iPad. <laughs> so that's new under the sun, buddy. <laughs> so I'm going to go back in time and give him an iPad. What do you say? My friend told me that if you wanted to make a time machine, you just had to really, 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 really... Pete Rollins told this to me. You just had to make the decision that you were actually going to make it. Like You had to make a 100% decision that you were going to make it and then decide that when you made it, you would just come back in time and tell yourself how you made it. Does that make sense? So you never have to make the time machine. You just, I'm going to make it. And then so if you're pressed, if you don't come back in time to tell you how to make it, then it didn't work. 
Yeah. No. Well, me and Pete found it hilarious. And I wanted to read this part because we talked about this last week. Um, for everything, there is a season and a time. For everything, for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and keep and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. This is a very somber book of the Bible, and I think it's worth reading. Um, and today I wanted to talk about it because I wanted to talk about sorrow of the Bible. And <clears throat> pain and how we don't often suffering is talked about in the Bible, but it's not always focused on sometimes people feel like there's not enough mentioned about suffering and the Bible doesn't confront suffering enough. And they may be right, but luckily we have theologians and preachers and pastors who've actually been able to look deeper into some of the Bible and into the Word and, and explain that. Um, there's a book written by, uh, gosh, what's his name? He wrote Forgeries. He wrote, why can't I remember his name? He's a professor. But he wrote The Problem with Suffering. And he's felt like the Bible didn't confront problems of suffering. Um, I'm going to turn to Romans. Romans 5, 3. Now, this is often how the New Testament deals with suffering. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials, for they know they are good for us. Now, if you looked back at Ecclesiastes, you could kind of see that there wasn't, uh, this is good for us. It was just, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything stinks. I'm going to go eat worms. This is bad. You know what I mean? And in the New Testament, that changes, and I think it changes with Christ. And this is where I think our faith really comes into it. If we do really want to experience Jesus, if we do really think Jesus is something we can't experience, or if Jesus was just a man, but, you know, that's a decision you have to make. But Paul says here, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they are good for us, and they help us learn to endure and endurance develops strength of character in us, and character strengthens our confident expectations of salvation. And the expect expectations will not disappoint us, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came just at the right time and died for us sinners. So problems and trials. This is interesting because... Another interesting thing is James and Paul disagreed on a lot. James James said the opposite of this. I mean, not James didn't say the opposite of this. James said the same same as this. But James said James, the book of James, he says a lot of the opposite of what Paul says. He says you can't basically be saved by faith alone, that you have to practice works and you have to do all that. And Paul says the opposite. So if you think there isn't contradictions in the Bible, I'm afraid to say there are. That's why Martin Luther here on Reformation Sunday, Martin Luther called James the Apostle of Straw, the Epistle of Straw. He did not like it. 
Um, but they agree on this. They agree that we can rejoice in our problems and our trials. And that's the new, that's the new thing we have within Christ is this idea of rejoicing in our problems and our trials, learning from them, growing from them. Now, I don't necessarily rejoice in my depression and my problem, my trials. But what I do is I seek out help and I seek out ways and tools to learn how to make them better and how to deal with them and how to navigate them. And by learning to navigate them, I learn things I learn things that make me stronger and give me better expectations on suffering. I recently had something where I was just completely convinced that this thing I had to do was just going to be a complete failure. I didn't want to go. I remember I got up, had to be there a certain time, had to get something done before I got there. And I was like, I'm not going to go. I got my car, sat my car for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, then got back out of my car, went back in my house. I'm like, I'm going to call and tell them I'm sick. I wasn't sick. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to do that. Then I was like, well, I'll just forget my notebook because I needed my notebook for this work that needed to be done. I'll just forget my notebook. You know, no big deal. And then I was like, but I really want to learn some of the other stuff that we're doing, so I need my notebook. (laughs) And this is me just being honest. This is my mind trying to come up with ways. This is problem solving. Just not very honest problem solving. And it was really tough. And I decided, you know what? I'm going to bite the bullet and I'm just going to go do this. And so I just went in and got to the point. They're like, Jay, what do you have for us? And I said, nothing. They're like, okay. Um, What's next? And it was just like, it wasn't like, okay. You know, but my expectations were that this was going to be bad that I was going to be rejected that I wasn't going to be accepted but I faced the issue, and what I lear- learned from that was is that my expectations of what was going to go on were, just got in the way. You know, it made it made I made this mountain out of a molehill. And what I realized is that sometimes it's okay to just face things. Now they're not always going to go that easy, but this time it did go that easy. This time it was okay, and I have to keep that in mind. You know that I don't have to manipulate things. That I can be honest. Sometimes it's going to be tough, but then there's other times where it's going to work out, you know. And so that that was that was kind of a nice moment for me that I held on to, um, and that my psychiatrist also told me to hold on to, was saying, you know, remember that your the stories that we tell ourselves aren't always true. The things that we build up in our minds. Um, learn, help us learn to endure I don't know sometimes I feel like learning to endure is really a pain endurance develops strength of character and the character strengthens our confidence and I often hear about that like when people say failure is some of the greatest lessons you can learn is from failure um and I guess that's true. I, I've learned that somewhat in my life. But it's tough. And when you're in the middle of it, it just doesn't feel good. And it's not a nice verse in the Bible. It's a painful, tough situation. You know? But when we do learn to uh, endure, when we do learn from our failures, it kind of sparks something new in us. It allows, If we allow it to, it can spark a new a second chance or a third chance or a fourth chance. You say, okay, I'm going to try this differently. I don't have to give up. I don't have to commit suicide. I do not have to, you know, go do something else. I don't have to quit my job. I don't have to do this. Okay, I failed at it, but now I've learned from that and I'm going to go on. When I was doing Revolution in L.A., long time ago, 97, it was just failing 
just wasn't working. And uh, it was so frustrating. And we were working with another church, and the church was not very comfortable with our methods. And uh, so it was fighting tooth and nail. So finally I left because I couldn't deal with it anymore. But I left and I moved back to Atlanta, Georgia. And when I moved back to Atlanta, I had a new hunger to learn from that failure. And so I got to Atlanta and I just started. Just started the church up again, made it happen, linked myself with people who I knew I could work with a little bit more. And it was it became a successful thing. But I had that fire because of all that failure. You know, I had that, I've got to do this now because of the failures that I'd had before. Tough things, right? Um, let me jump over to Romans 8. Thirty-five, oh. and this is what I think I like. I like this verse, and this is just so we know what we're going through, suffering and hard times. This isn't again one of those Jesus tests. Uh, Eight thirty-five says, "Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love?" Does it mean He no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? are persecuted or hungry or cold or in danger or threatened with death. Even the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day and are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelmingly victory is ours through Christ who loved us. I am convinced that nothing can separate us from this love. Death can't, life can't, the angels can't, the demons can't. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, and even the power of hell can't keep God's love away. Whether we are high above the sky or in the deepest oceans, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Jesus Christ. Now, in the NRSV, It says, this is, there was a word that I really liked in our survey. is a little bit more accurate, but sometimes harder to read. Okay, yeah, listen to this. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution, famine, nakedness, or peril, or sword? I just written, but listen to this. I, I want to look at the, the distress. Will hardship or distress separate us from the love of God? It's easy to say the gates of hell and uh, swords and nakedness and and things like that, but it's also saying distress, depression, giving up, hurting, pain, self-doubt, insecurity. Was that keep us from the love of God? It feels like it sometimes. For me, it feels like I'm separated from God at times and I don't want anything to do with God because I'm in so much pain. And I'm like, oh, God, you can't handle this pain. I know you love me, but this part you can't, you just don't, you know, this part's different. This part has to do with my family, or this part doesn't have to do with my ministry, or this part doesn't have to do with my spiritual life. You know, this is depression, so I go to my psychiatrist for it, you know. But thank God, thank you, God, for, you know, the other stuff. But it's not saying that. It's saying no matter our distress, it will not separate us from God. It's love. So no matter what our depression is, no matter what our pain is, no matter what our distress is, or persecution, or our hardships in life, of fears of paying bills, how we're going to do this, taxes, which is, oh gosh, 
Does anybody like taxes? One person likes taxes. And <laughs> it's only, no, it's like not even November yet, and I'm already sweating taxes. I'm already like, what do I do? I've got to make sure everything's okay. I'm, I'm a worry wart. I, I stress about a lot of things. I, I'm stressed about I'm going on tour next week for uh, the Bible, Loosen the Bible Belt tour down south, and I'm stressed about that. But, because I don't like to be away from my family that long. But, nothing ke- keeps us away from the love of Christ. And it goes on to say, not the depths of hell. So if the depths of hell can't keep us away from the love of Christ, then obviously our distress and our worries for today and tomorrow can't either. Now the thing is, is can we find solace in that? If we're seeking Christ, if we want to have a Christ life, if we're followers of Christ, then there must be some sort of peace that passes understanding, some sort of peace that allows us to connect to that and find the reality of that. Am I right? I mean, I I often depend on self-dependence, you know, and I often am not a very spiritual person, which is odd being a pastor, you know, like a wash and wear kind of guy, like, I just live my life and I don't believe in all the hocus pocus. But I want to believe in the hocus pocus. I want to believe more in in that Jesus is there and that that love is real and that acceptance is real in the midst of my hell, in the midst of my time, and that it's preparing me for something greater and it's preparing me to love people more. That these words that are going out online and that are going out here in service is encouraging someone else to go on and move forward. And then that's how Christ's love works. Because Christ's love is infinite. We're finite, but we can take part in the infinite by passing it forward. So you're loved no matter what your distress, no matter what your pain is. And that is ultimately it, where you are good with God. You are accepted in the midst of it all. Now, if I could just buy into that a little bit more, it would be good. And I'm trying to. And that's why this is a sermon today. I'm sorry that I sniffle on the mic. It's annoying. Um, Now, Jesus says in Matthew... Matthew 11. Thirty five. Uh, there's not a Matthew eleven thirty five. Oh, twenty eight. Thank goodness. Oops. There is. Matthew 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Now, the verse we just read earlier that says that our distress will not keep us from the love of God, okay? We just read that earlier. And here it's saying, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. So that love, I have to believe, that's being talked about in Romans that Paul's talking about has to have a connection to this rest. The assurance that we are loved and accepted in the midst of our hell. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. For I am gentle and humble in heart and will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So I hope you can see the connection here. For Paul, it was all about God's love and God's grace and God's acceptance. That was Paul's thing because he was a Pharisee and he came from a very different world. And for him, that was the Reformation. It's, you know, it's Reformation Sunday. For him, that was the Reformation. For, for 
Luther reading this was the Reformation stuff, you know. But then you go back to Jesus, and Jesus is saying very similar things to saying, my yoke is easy, take this upon you, blah, blah, blah. And here Romans is saying, not, this will not separate you from the love of God. So you see this correlation of love, peace, yoke is easy, I'm here to be with you, I'm here to take your burden, if you'll allow me to. It's tough. Because you're like, is this, you know, I mean, part of me goes, like, am I doing this, putting this in the magic man in the sky? You know, but then there's other part of me that says, you know, Jesus has been very real in my life. And I've, I've experienced moments of, of such peace and such happiness and such joy that I want to be able to continue to do that with my pain and with my suffering. And I want all of you to be able to do that and find solace and find peace with your suffering through Christ. This is a church after all. But there's also this, because I like to make sure we cover every base. Matthew 16 24 says uh, that Jesus told his disciples, if you, if any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their lives will lose it. And those who lose their lives, for those who lose, uh, will find it, for what will it profit? Oh, no, no, I didn't want to read that. For those who want to save their lives will lose it. And those who lose their lives will I'm sorry, I'm having a very dyslexic moment right now. Rewind. Then Jesus told them, his disciples, if any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their lives will lose it. And those who lose their lives for my sake will find it. So you've got this thing where it says, take up your cross. Okay? Okay. So it's saying these things aren't going to separate you from the love of God, worry and suffering and things like that. But at the same time, it's saying take up your cross, which is, which to Jews at this time meant suffering and torture and giving up of their lives. So there's still that. It's not a promise that everything's going to be easy. What it's saying is, is that these things can work together. You know, that there's going to be a requirement to take your life, give up your life, carry your cross, you know. But there's also the idea that God cares, Jesus cares about your suffering. And guess what? If we love our neighbor as ourselves, who do we love when we love our God? We love our neighbor then we care about each other's suffering and we share in one another's suffering and one another burden. It doesn't take a lot to send a text to say, hey, how are you doing? Thinking about you. I got a text the other day. He said, just thinking about you. I never know how to <laughs> respond to those. I'm like, oh, thanks, man. I'm thinking about you. Or I hope you're doing well. <laughs> But at the same time, it's nice, and it doesn't take a lot for us to reach out and just check on, check in on others, and to be that Christ, to be that Jesus. That's where radical theology kind of can kind of play into it, is where we are, it's not an idol that we're looking at, but we become flesh, we become that, we become the church, not waiting for Jesus to text us because I don't think he has an iPhone yet. <laughs> I think he has a Samsung. What's the ones that explode? <laughs> um, now, Paul, now this whole thing of taking up your cross can be also just loving the wrong people.
people that other people don't want you to love. When Jesus talks about loving your enemies and doing good to those who persecute you, well, you can remember you're probably loving someone else's enemies too. And so often taking up your cross can just be loving the people that other people don't want you to love. Or, or it can be like what happened to Paul, the apostle. He was imprisoned and ultimately killed. I mean, these guys, if you want to take it within the context, these guys were really picking up their crosses. For us now, it's a little bit different. I think the pain is real, and it doesn't nullify that. But even if you look at people like Martin Luther King, what taking up his cross looked like, or Gandhi, you know, or different folks like that, what, what, what that looked like. So I want to end this with words from Martin Luther King. I don't know if I have enough Bibles here today. <laughs> Dr. King wrote in his sermon, uh, Transformed Nonconformists. He wrote this. Honesty impels me to admit that transformed nonconformity, which is always costly and never altogether comfortable, may mean walking through the valley of the shadow of suffering, losing a job, or having six-year-old daughter ask, Daddy, why do you have to go to jail so much? Which was happening quite a bit with Dr. King. And I, I'm going to just stick with this for a second to treat this like a verse because I think he was a he should have been a biblical writer. I think the letter to him from a Birmingham jail should have been canonized, to be honest with you. I think that should have been added to the Bible. Honestly, honesty implies in me that it admits transformed nonconformity, which is always costly, never altogether comfortable. It may mean walking through the valley of the shadow of suffering, losing a job. It happens. I've watched it. I've seen it happen personally where things just changed when you walked the nonconformity way. When you take the road less traveled, you might not end up being popular or, you know, in my case, speaking everywhere. It just is something that happens. I'm going to go on and read more from this. But we are gravely mistaken to think Christianity protects us from the pain and agony of mortal existence. That's one of the things I want to leave you with today. But we are gravely mistaken to think that Christianity protects us from the pain and agony of mortal existence. Christianity has always insisted that the cross we bear precede the crown we wear. To be a Christian, one must take up their cross with all of its difficulties and agonizing and tragedy-packed content and carry it until the very cross leaves its mark upon us and redeems us to the more excellent way that comes only through suffering. Suffering is a reality of life. Suffering is a reality of Christianity. Christianity is not a magic protector against suffering. We are gravely mistaken to think that Christianity protects us from the pain and agony of moral existence. You know, there's that sermon, I can do all things through Christ who strengthen me. But Paul was writing that from prison. That was a prison verse. It wasn't like, I can get a Cadillac through Christ who strengthens me. But I was a, a much younger skateboarder. I wanted to put, I wrote that verse on my skateboard thinking, I can do any trick through Christ who strengthens me. You know. But I learned as my dad was in prison that that was a prison verse.
suffering verse. So, you're not alone. The Bible covers suffering. I'm a pastor who suffers and needs to hear these things. And I hope that in some way, the truth, hearing the truth, hearing reality, will help set us free a little bit more. It's not a feel-good gospel. It's not a feel-good message. It's just reality. It's just truth. And truth, I hope, transforms us. So, hey, guess what? You're going to go through hell. You're loved. Know that. But hopefully that hell is going to teach you a lesson and help you learn to endure more and maybe learn to love more and help others going through hell as well. I'm going to pray real quick and then I'm going to pass the hat. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, but also for the realities of life and that those are shown in your Bible, in the book, in this collection of writings. Help us to face those uh, oncoming. Help us to understand what your love and peace really is. Be our comforter. Help us to comfort others. Uh, may we learn our lessons faster so we can suffer less, if that be your will. Amen. Um, Revolution is a nonprofit. Uh, everyone listening online and here, church. Uh, we exist through donations. Um, with the holidays coming, it gets tight. So. You know, we ask anybody who can to please make your donations. And anybody who's giving online, I'd ask to please leave your address. When you give online, not just your email, but leave your address because I'd love to send you a letter thanking you for giving. I can send you an email, but I'm a little bit slower on emails. So I'd love to send you a personal letter. Um, but we really could use your support. But as always, we'd rather have you than your money. So uh, there's that. Um, if anybody knows some great, uh, what are they, <laughs> grants, anybody who wants to give a grant to a church, let us know. We could use it. Um, there's so much more we want to do with the online ministry, online service and promotion and just getting the word out there and rethinking how we do church. Um, and your support really helps us do that. All right. Uh, thank you so much for listening, and uh, we'll talk to you next week.